the man who will be part of a seven-member Hall of Fame induction class for the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. It is a guy who is already a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame and is now going to be one of just three people on the planet to be in both of those respective Halls of Fame. It is uh, former Bills coach Marv Levy joining us on the line. Marv, uh, first and foremost, congratulations. Uh, you know, you've been down this road before with a different Hall of Fame. How does it feel to be part of two football Hall of Fames on both sides of the border? Well, I'm absolutely overwhelmed, to tell you the truth. I got the call not too long ago that uh, it was happening. The current president of the Montreal Alouettes, uh, I think, uh, pushed for it <laughs> quite a bit. And uh, I'm just blown away, honored to, to be inducted. Uh, actually, I only coached in Montreal for five years. He went to the Grey Cup game, three of those five, and won two of them. Um, and um, it, it, I had a wonderful owner, and the fan base was magnificent back then. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really blown away on her. The only other coach that's been in both uh, um, is uh, the Minnesota Vikings, Bud Grant. And Warren Moon as a player, so uh, I'm I'm very honored. Yeah, Marv, you you said it. What what was the um, when you took over the Montreal Alouettes? What years was that? Were that and what what kind of shape was that franchise in? Why were they looking to make a change to, to head coach? And give us give us a little insight as to that situation when you landed in Montreal. Well, it was uh, the year there was 1973. The year before, I'd been an assistant coach with the um, uh, Washington Redskins. We went to the Super Bowl, lost to the undefeated Miami Dolphins uh, in that Super Bowl game, 14-7, to a close one. But for many years, when I was coaching as an assistant in the NFL, assistant to George Allen, there was a, uh, a scout and then eventually the general manager of the uh, Montreal Alouettes named J.I. Albrecht used to come around. We got to know each other. We had good relations. And apparently when the head job opened there, he went to the owner, Mr. Sam Berger, and pushed for me. They interviewed me. It sounded great uh, uh, to be a head coach in professional football. Montreal is a very intriguing town, very intriguing city. Uh, the, the multi-culture of English and French background. And so um, I went up there, but they played in an old, worn-out stadium. I forget the name of it. Uh, and uh, you, you could hardly park there. The winners were miserable. And then all of a sudden, the Olympic Games were there. They built a huge stadium, uh, the, the Olympic Stadium. And we went there. 68,000 people came to the Games, and our teams took off from there. Our owner, Sam Berger, uh, he went all out my first year there, and he gave a contract that's never before and never since in the Canadian League to that year's Heisman Trophy winner, Johnny Rogers. And Johnny was a great player, although he had a lot of emotional problems back then since they've been solved. And then, you know, Marv, I, I've, I'm curious because, you know, your, your, your roots are obviously in American football. How much... How much apprehension did you have going, I mean, building teams and, and mental toughness and team unity, that, that, that's a common theme through any sport, and those, those things translate, but was, what level of apprehension did you have in becoming a head coach of a Canadian team, where, as we know, the field is a different size, the rules are different? What, what level of apprehension did you have with that part of the new job? Well, actually, it wasn't apprehension. It was uh, some self-doubts. Uh, There's so much to learn. Uh, the, the size of the Canadian field, the end zones were 20 yards deep. They were wider. The, the square yardage of a Canadian field is more than twice the square yardage of uh, uh, what's in, in the U.S. Uh, the rule, there are a lot of rules differences. They have only three downs. Uh, people can be in motion towards the line of scrimmage. Right. More than one man can be in motion. Uh, a, a kick that goes into the end zone that's not a field goal and is a one-pointer. Um, <laughs> there, there were so many differences, but I went up with this uh, belief, and thank goodness I believe it was right. The same things won. If you run, throw, block, tackle, catch, kick better than your opponent, you're going to win. 
So it's fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. And Steve may know uh, the focus we had on fundamentals. It's hard work. It's labor in the hot sun during training camp. I had Bruce Smith come in, into me, my office one day up in training camp, hot as can be with the Buffalo Bills, and say, hey, coach, I have a question for you. Oh, yeah, Bruce, what is it? Who put the fun in fundamentals? Yeah, yeah very hard work. That's right. <laughs> Mark, you you, uh, you started your career in coaching a long time ago. You told us a story. I remember uh, in a team meeting one time, and Chris uh, did an article on it years ago for the Buffalo Bills. When you started, you told us that you had, you know, saved some money, and you want there are coaching clinics all over the country, and you happened to be able to to attend one uh, where the final speaker of the of the camp and the uh, seminar was going to be from Bear Bryant, the great Alabama head coach who'd started it. Uh, tech, West Texas Tech, I believe, um, and you uh, had signed up for this um, coaching seminar because you thought it was really high quality, but by the end of it, camps were starting, it was late in the summer, and everybody had vac- evacuated, so give us an idea about this last session of this coaching clinic that you attended and the participants that were there. Well, I was. It was a weekend coaching clinic. It went on a, uh, uh, a Saturday and a Sunday. Uh, there were hundreds of coaches there, mostly from high, uh, from high schools and small colleges throughout California, and a, a variety of speakers, Bud Wilkinson and so on. And the final speaker on Sunday evening was supposed to be Bear Bryant, uh, the great coach at the University of Alabama. Well, we got word that Bryant... Um, his plane was delayed. He couldn't make it. He wouldn't be there on time. If anybody wanted to stay until Monday morning, Bryant would come in uh, and uh, give a lecture that, that afternoon. Well, there were several hundred coaches, but they had to go back. There were only about four or five of us who remained around. Um, and um, we were we were waiting there. I was had been an assistant, I think, at the time, maybe at the U of New Mexico. We were waiting there and waiting and waiting. Bryant finally came. There were four or five people in the audience, and Bryant said, wow, you guys stayed. That's wonderful. Well, come on up to my room. What are your names? The names of the other guys were Dick Vermeil, Bobby Ross, Bill Walsh, and, uh, and, and me, and... Uh, all of us were either assistants in high school or something, but that's where I got to meet them. That's where I got to meet all those guys, and uh, uh, they were—they all became members of my coaching staff much further on later in our career. Yeah, and I think all of them as head, head coaches had at least been to one Super Bowl. Um, yeah. Because Bobby Ross got there with the Chargers, I know, and we know what, what you, Dick Vermeil, and Bill Walsh obviously did in the league. So kind of crazy, but do you think there was – the, I think the one question I never asked you, Marv, was, you know, after you guys finished what probably was essentially close to a one-on-one clinic with, with Bear Bryant, of all people, uh, I'm sure you guys <laughs> talked afterwards. What, what were the biggest takeaways from, from what he was sharing with you guys that day? Oh, I don't know. He just talked about organizing practices. I, I really can't recall exactly. It was organizing practices and then how important defense was. The game isn't all offense. And, um, and he, he was uh, he, he was a very cordial guy, and uh, I got to know him over the years, got to know him a little bit better, and he was always very helpful to me. Great coach. What uh, are your thoughts these days, Marv, as, as you watch the game? We're, about, we're a couple of minutes away from the draft. What are some of your memorable experiences here in Buffalo with you and Bill Pol- We had Bill Polian on the, on the show a couple of weeks ago. We were reminiscing about the fact that you know, we, always, we all get caught up in the draft and how this player or that player may be the difference maker or, you know, or, or maybe it's, it's, he's not going to be, or all of a sudden you pick a guy in the fifth or sixth round and he turns into this superhuman athlete and it's an awesome find. What are some of your recollections of your days in Buffalo in the draft, not so much on the field, but on the days you drafted players? Oh, golly. Uh, I, I can remember one, uh, for instance, that uh, uh, it was during the, pre- the season prior to the draft, I came into the – office one day after practice was over and uh, Bill Polian said Marv 
Uh, how would you like to make a trade for the guy who was the number one pick in the draft last year, but um, uh, number one pick in the draft last year, but uh, he hasn't signed yet. The Indianapolis Colts uh, got him. And uh, <clears throat> I asked him what we had to do to get the man. He said uh, we'd have to give up uh, two firsts and a second. I said, oh, golly, no, we don't want to do that. And Bill kept talking until I finally, he, he convinced me. We traded for Cornelius Bennett. And the, one week later, Cornelius was on our team about uh, in the middle of the second quarter. We put him into the game. First play of the game, he sacked John Elway. Elway looked at him like, what's happening? <laughs> Next year, the draft came. We had no first-round draft choice. We badly needed a running back in in the first round six running backs were selected we couldn't make a pick until the second round we had to pick some guy some some guy named Thurman Thomas from Oklahoma State <laughs> sometimes it works out marv yeah you're darn right well we got a uh, my first year there while while i was uh, sitting in the office one day uh, golly, I can't remember this guy's name. He was on the staff that I inherited. I had midseason. He came into my office and he said, Marv, the Houston Oilers have a guy that was on injured reserve. In those days, to bring him off, you had to put him on waivers. Uh, he said, uh, I, I, tell you, I think we ought to claim him. Uh, I said, okay, let's do it. What's his name? He said, Steve Tasker. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Yeah. That. You know who that guy was? I'll tell you who it was. It was Joe Farragelli. That's who it was, Joe Fergelli. Yeah, it was a tight. Yeah, it was a tight. He was the offensive coordinator my rookie year in Houston. Yeah, that it is a um, it, it it still is, and it's even a smaller football world these days, Marv. And it um, it just got a little bit warmer with you going in the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. I can't tell you how how thrilled I am for you and all the old guys from the Buffalo Bills. Um, I teased Bill Poley in a couple of weeks ago that if and uh, that if. There was a Hall of Fame for the human race. I think you might be a finalist. Uh, you've got all of us <laughs> pulling for you. Uh, la last thing I want to ask you is this as well. Um, I, last night, through coincidence, somebody texted me that they were watching The Four Falls of Buffalo. Uh, and it's obviously the documentary, 30 for 30 documentary from ESPN that they did about the four Super Bowls that the Bills went to. Uh, and... Of course, you look back on those times as I do now, so many, you know, a couple of three decades later with a lot of fondness, not so much that we lost games, of course, but for the guys that we participated in those games with. What, uh, what are your thoughts now about looking back and Bill's fans, and you've seen a, a fan base be so prideful and so supportive of a team who did go through some rough times after those games uh, what are your thoughts now as you think back about Buffalo and, and the current state of the team getting to the AFC Championship again? Well, all right. I retain nothing but the fondest of memories of the players of the organization. It isn't just a great quarterback or a great coach or a great team. It's total organization that wins. And it was one fantastic organization. An owner like Ralph Wilson, a general manager like Bill Walsh and John Butler, a director of player personnel and then general manager. Uh, and the one thing we did, did say when I was interviewed with Ralph Wilson, uh, you know, what are you looking for in players, Marvin? I, I outlined a few things that I said, but we're looking only for guys with guys for high character. Their personalities may differ. Some extroverts, some might be more introverted. But do they show up for work on time? Do they not blame their their teammates or somebody else if something goes wrong? And I, I remember those years so so fondly uh, in, in Buffalo and great fans, great fans. And I, I remember once after uh, when we lost that first, that first Super Bowl game, we came back in town. You may recall this. There were, we were bused downtown into the, uh, I don't know if it was City Hall or what, but there were 30,000 fans down in the square to greet us and cheer us on. And uh, I, th I, I did, man, and, and to welcome back Scott Norwood and the, to boost his morale. And uh, that's when we all felt that you, we were pointing out to the fans, are the reason that we will go back. And uh, 
I do remember one time on one of my call-in shows with Paul McGuire, however, after we had lost uh, our second Super Bowl game, I got a call from one fan and said, Coach, please don't go back to the Super Bowl. I can't take it. I can't stand the pain when they lose a game. I, 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 did, I don't want you to go back, please. And I just told him, I said, Sir, I understand your anguish. I feel it, but I'm glad you're not on my team. No. <laughs> Now, Marv, in, in reading up a little bit more on your CFL career, I believe I read, and you can corroborate whether this is accurate or not, you were not only the coach, but were you, did you serve as GM up there, too, with Montreal at the same time? No, I was not the GM. Okay. Uh, um, I know you were the GM I think, here. I, in, think he, I think he wanted to appoint me as GM when J.I. Albrecht left. Okay. But there was a guy in the organization who really had done it so well, and I pointed that out to our owner, Sam Berger, a guy named Bob Geary. And uh, uh, I asked, really, that Bob be made the general manager. Okay, fair and enough. So I'll take it in a different direction. You did sir, come back here to serve as GM of the Bills. Um, having sat in both of those chairs uh, and knowing the interworkings between coach and GM from both seats, um, can you just kind of walk us through the kinds of conversations that those two people in those two positions need to have to make sure they're in lockstep going into a draft, for example? Yeah. Well, first of all, yeah, oh, you talk and talk and talk leading up to the draft forever. And you, you have to realize that, you know, if you've you got a good working relationship, you're going to be about 85% together. And uh, you might disagree about 15 percent, but it was so fortunate the the, the trust I had in in uh, in Bill Polian and John Butler uh, to work with them, and even my brief period back there as general manager, I had high regard. I think he should have been kept longer. He would have done better for Dick Duran. I think Dick would have done a a, a a rising better job given the time. But, um, no, it can be – I was fortunate. The general managers I worked with were, were always pretty darn good people. And uh, uh, some of them maybe tried to be bullies and so on. They have strong opinions, and, uh, they, they, and sometimes you do disagree a little bit. And um, I can remember, speaking of disagreeing, I'm, I'm drifting a little bit uh, from the, from the uh, question, but as far as disagreeing um, – I remember once, you, you remember this, Steve, probably, where two of our coaches, um, Tom Bresnahan and uh, Nick Nicolau, got in a fight, uh, an, an argument over something in our team meeting. And uh, uh, Ralph Wilson called me in. He wanted me to fire them both. And I pleaded with Mr. Wilson, no, Mr. Wilson, they're good guys. They're good coaches. They know what they're doing. And I figured I might get myself fired by that position and ralph said to me he said ah i still don't agree with you but you're the coach okay keep him here <laughs> <laughs> and and a couple of years later he told me they were among his favorite guys yeah that, well it's funny too because yeah those guys i remember that those guys did get into a fight and then the next week they're having breakfast in the hotel at the next game i mean they're you know they're sitting down there the two of them that's the way football is sometimes particularly when you're when you're passionate about it. One last thing I have for you, Marv, is, as we roll down the road here, you were a head coach in the NFL past the age of 70. I think you were 72 uh, when you coached your last season. Uh, and Bill Belichick of the New England Patriots is still coaching. How, what, what keeps you know, coaches able to be energetic? Because I, I just had a birthday, and I'm ready to retire, um, and I'm not even 60 yet. So what, what keeps you guys energized, and how long do you think – uh, a guy like Bill Belichick, or you, even you yourself, what kept you going for so long? Oh, well, I, the wonderful organization. Uh, I, 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 I quote Jim Kelly, uh, when, when no one ever wants to come to Buffalo, but once they're there, no one ever wants to leave it. And uh, you, you're an example of that, by the way, uh, <laughs> some guy from Kansas. Yeah. Um, but... Um, I don't know. I, I, I love the game. We had great players. We had a great organization. The team owner made a big difference. And believe it or not, Steve, about a year or two after uh, I, I retired, I sort of said, gee, maybe I did it too soon, yeah. you know, but I need to get a deep breath there somewhere. Yeah. 
Marv, last one from me, and we appreciate the time as always. Uh, I know that the 2020 uh, Canadian Football Hall of Fame class, their induction ceremony was postponed because of the COVID pandemic, and they're going to be inducted August 6th in Hamilton uh, during their Hall of Fame game that they have between Hamilton and Calgary. And at least from what I can read here, it's saying your induction ceremony is now scheduled for Grey Cup Week in November. I'm curious, though, with the border still closed, what information, if any, have you been given about induction ceremony? Uh, just that that's when it's scheduled, and we'll tell you more later. You know, it's, <laughs> and they'll let us know, I'm sure, uh, uh, what, what, what happens. And uh, I'll be sure to bring my muffler and my uh, gloves. Uh, it's in November up there. <laughs> Marv, thank you so much. Congratulations on being inducted into the Canadian Pro Football Hall of Fame. It's, a, it's an honor. It's, it's a thrill for us to talk to you. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Well, thank you, and thank you all. And speaking of the Hall of Fame, I'm still looking forward to that day when I'm going to be there, Steve, and you are too, and it'll come, I promise you. Well, I appreciate it, Mark. Thanks. Okay, thank you both.